So Matt, how's it going? It's good to meet you finally. Yeah, it's going good. Thanks for having me on the show. So you were recommended to me by a friend who had read your latest book, and I have my my greedy little hands on a copy right there, Why We Drive Towards a Philosophy of the Open Road. And he was just, uh, he's like, you guys are going to have such an awesome conversation. And I got to tell you, I really, I'm about halfway through your book. I haven't finished it yet, but I, I, I'm really, really enjoying the, you know, what I would view as a, as a metaphor for, for um, individual autonomy and how it interacts with, with social constraints and all these things things that we talk about as as social scientists so I, I, re- I really enjoy it so I don't always read enjoy the books I read so so thank you for that um, and and I want to start off uh, uh, a couple weeks ago I was having dinner with a friend and his 17 uh, year old son was there and and we were talking about um, driving and and I asked him so like is it, is it really cool to uh, finally having control over your own life. And he didn't have his driver's license. He didn't want his driver's license. And he's grown up in a city where at an age when he doesn't need to have a driver's license. And I had this sort of visceral reaction that I really couldn't articulate because when I was a kid, a driver's license was the the ticket to controlling my, my destiny. And he didn't see it that way. And I suppose that story doesn't surprise you because that that's essentially your book is criticizing that mindset. Yeah, I mean, as it just as a practical matter, I can understand not wanting to deal with the hassles of driving yourself, maybe <clears throat> especially if you've been ferried around by your parents uh, your, your whole life. And I think there's, there's clearly a lot more parental involvement in kids' lives and getting them to far-flung activities. So they get used to being chauffeured but like you, I mean, I actually bought my first car before I even got a learner's permit. It was a 63 VW Bug. And uh, yeah, I was working at a Porsche shop when I was 15. So I don't know. Maybe the, the whole romance with the automobile is over with. If so, um, you know, what does that say? Does that have some larger implications? So I guess that's what we're going to try to get into here. Yeah, my my first car, and you, you talk about this in the book. My first car was a Ford Futura, which I spent a hundred dollars on, and I proceeded to to rebuild it. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, putty and spray paint involved in trying to make it look acceptable. But um, back then, and I haven't worked on a car since I was twenty five years old, but it's it's virtually impossible unless you want to be a computer programmer to work on a, a modern car. And you, you talk about that shift away from, from a machine, a, an internal combustion engine, towards something that's um, either more complicated or just more obtuse, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's a common complaint, that cars are so computerized, that they're so you know, they're opaque and sort of unintelligible to the user. And there's definitely some of that um, I guess I would say two things that kind of cut in a different direction. I mean, that's a complaint I've made myself. But on the other hand, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes wrong with cars that has nothing to do with computers. The usual stuff, CV joints and brakes and clutches and all that. So, um, you know, there's no diagnostic software involved in doing probably 90% of the stuff, 80% of the stuff that goes wrong with cars. And the other um would be to highlight that i think we're living through this second golden age of hot rodding because yeah it is kind of daunting a little bit intimidating to get into um you know, you know digital engine management um but there's these forums have developed on the internet devoted to sort of hacking the software and turning it to illicit purposes and making cars go faster than they're supposed to and it's amazing how we've pushed the state of the art to places no one would have thought possible even 20 years ago because of this, this sharing of information. So it's a mixed bag. The, the, the whole digital thing um, allows you to, to tune for crazy levels of, of performance that weren't possible before. So where did, what, when did it strike you that, that driving was 
was a metaphor for um, sort of individual determination. I forget the, the words you use specifically, but, um, you know, driving yourself, essentially. Yeah, well, I guess <clears throat> the maybe the overarching concern <clears throat> of the book is for the status of the individual. And uh, in particular, what I see is an erosion of the space for skilled action and intelligent human action. Because so much of, uh, so many domains of human activity have gotten colonized by kind of systems that want to do it for us, whether it's a bureaucracy or some tech. Um, I think you can think of driverless cars, for example, as one instance of this wider pattern, uh, really a shift in our relationship to the physical world in which the demands of skill and competence give way to a promise of safety and convenience, uh, sort of taking human beings out of the control loop. And I think if you go far enough down that road, uh, eventually the whole world starts to look like one big assisted living facility. You, um, you describe, um, I'm thinking of uh, Frederick Hayek talks about scientism and and the efforts by the economics profession to try to turn human action and all of its complexities into an equation so that it be better represents um, the physical sciences. And, and this, there's, there's a similarity here where, where so much of public policy is, is trying to engineer the humanity out of of, of human systems and replace it with uh, ultimately something like a driverless car, the presumption being that that's, that's safer. And I think you might even argue that that's not necessarily the case and looked at in its totality. Well, there's interesting factual questions about the, you know, the, the actual engineering with driverless cars and just how safe they're likely to be and how likely the whole vision is to come to fruition. And, uh, you know, the people involved in driverless cars have gotten, they're not quite as bullish as they were, say, five years ago when we were hearing that, oh, you know, by 2020, <laughs> we'd all be in driverless cars. Um, and clearly the, the whole push for driverless cars uh, is very much a top-down kind of thing. It's not a response to consumer demand. When when Pew polls people about their attitudes to driverless cars, they don't really trust it. They don't seem to think they really need it or want it. But there's, you know, asserting the inevitability of it, I think, serves a couple functions. It, it serves to demoralize any kind of political opposition to it. Um, you sort of offer this picture of the future as though it's a prediction uh, which is a good way to attract investment and, and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> and I think really where this starts to touch home is when we realize what an awkward fit driverless cars would be with human drivers. There's no prospect of these two kinds of intelligence sharing the road gracefully together. There was one episode <clears throat> where a, a Google self-driving car came up on a intersection it was a four-way stop and so it came to a complete stop and waited for um you know the other drivers to do the same but of course that's not what people do they tend to kind of roll through uh so the 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 robot car got completely paralyzed it didn't know what to do because people weren't following the rules and the, the guy in charge, the Google engineer, said that what he had learned from this episode is that human beings need to be less idiotic. And of course, what he meant by that is they need to behave more like robots and be rule followers. So, but what I found interesting is that it was completely invisible to, to him what was actually going on at that intersection where people make eye contact. Maybe one person gives a little nod to wave the other person through. There's a whole social intelligence that's happening there that that is not, you don't even see it if you think the mind is basically an inferior version of a computer. I think that gets to what Hayek is saying there. 
Yeah, and, and like the simplicity of, you know, the phrase follow the rules is you have to unpack that perhaps because the, the people at that intersection were absolutely following the rules and and maybe many of them were are, were inarticulate and and learned over a process of engaging with yes. other drivers at at intersections and and his version of the rules was was grossly simplistic and and perhaps idiotic I, I like that. Um, so what what you're referring to is you know this idea of tacit knowledge. There are sort of norms that are not fully articulate in our minds, but we abide by them, and they're the basis for our cooperation together. If you go to a place like Rome, uh, you know, an inter a busy intersection, it looks like chaos. There don't seem to be any rules that are actually being followed. But what are people doing? They're paying attention. They bring a sort of disposition of flexibility to the situation. There's a certain amount of trust. And that's where I think it gets really interesting, um, the idea that there is a social trust that gets built up through our everyday activities like driving, where we have to extend to one another a presumption of individual competence. And sometimes it goes really well when we're all kind of on the same page. And of course, sometimes it doesn't. So I have, a, I have a libertarian friend who has this question he always asks people, and it's sort of his version of a test to see if you're an actual libertarian. And he asks, what is the best way to make sure that you're safe, to defend yourself, to defend your home? and and protect your life and property and inevitably the answer is um get a gun and defend yourself and and he says no that's not the solution at all the solution is to live in a community where other people respect your life and your property and it's that it's that tension between um driving in your metaphor and depending on other drivers to to sort of respect your life and property and to follow those those inarticulate rules at the same time it's and so when i when i read that i was like yeah that reminds me of my friend and that story because it's true you 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 need a rule based society but rules are not necessarily something that comes from google or um, even even laws but but how people agree to treat each other yeah, and so we're talking about a form of social intelligence that is very hard to replicate with machine logic, which is why it doesn't show up on the radar. And there's a kind of uh, effort to delegitimize it or pretend it doesn't exist and treat us as incompetent. So that seems to be really the refrain uh, behind a lot of automation and in particular driverless cars is that human beings are no good at doing this or doing that. Uh, we're irrational. And I think that takes some of its um, kind of current popularity from this you know, behavioral economics revolution of the last 20 years or so, 30 years where the idea is that we're really no good at reasoning and need all kinds of help in the form of external nudges and sort of scaffolding the situation to, to herd us into different directions. And clearly that's a vision that informs, um, well, Google in particular, uh, where they're trying to sort of curate an information ecosystem so that you have, you know, the right choices uh, to make. And so when you're talking about Google now making cars, this logic of a kind of trusteeship and supervision by a benevolent entity that sort of knows better than you, slipping out of the screen and ordering the, the physical world where there's no option to unplug from it, that's where it starts to get a little creepy, I think. Yeah, it, it, it reminded me, and I don't, I don't know if you've, thought of this comparison, but when that, that Google engineer said people need to be less idiotic, it, it reminded me of the, the grandiose aspirations of sort of the original progressive project, which was to apply the, 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 the physical sciences and the, the smartest people you would gather and 
and sort of re-engineer society from the top down. And that's where some really awful ideas like eugenics came from and all that stuff. And it, it reminded me of that. Had you, had you ever thought of that comparison? Well, yeah. So I have a, a chapter in there you uh, might not have got to yet, but it's um, the title is A Glorious Collisionless Manner of Living. It's a phrase taken from Michael Oakeshott, who's a, a wonderful British thinker. So uh, there I'm talking about the smart city. And the smart city is part of the whole package of, of driverless cars because you have to make the driverless cars be able to coordinate with one another and sort of read the, the road with sensors and the road work and all that. So the smart city is this bigger picture where everything would be surveilled, everything sort of subject to an urban operating system of control that would be, you know, in the hands of some cartel of tech companies. And uh, yeah, I think you can see that very much as part of this longer tradition of sort of modernist um, social engineering, and in particular modernist urban planning, where there's some vision of perfect order. And to realize it, we just need to kind of, we need to clear a blank slate, you know, and in fact, in some cities like Paris, this is back, uh, Hausmann was the prefect of Paris back under Louis Napoleon, and he got permission to just bulldoze the city and rebuild it according to a master plan. And in the case of Paris, it worked out not too bad. It's a nice city to, to visit. But often, um, you know, it, it hasn't gone so well. Urban renewal in America consisted of destroying neighborhoods and then imposing some some plan that turned out to be disastrous. So I guess the common thread in a lot of that kind of progressive engineering is a lack of epistemic modesty, I would say, kind of not being aware of what you don't know and kind of plowing ahead. Yeah, yeah, and it's... it's um... It's, it's very evident to me, There's uh, and it gets to that um, scientism and, and the word you use, which I'm going to borrow from now on, is, is safetyism. And the idea that you can sort of um, engineer out of humanity things that, that put, us, put us at risk and, and take into its absurdity, um, it, it gets super creepy super quick. There's... I don't know if you've thought about this in the context of uh, COVID lockdowns, and I have no idea what you think about any of this stuff, but when the the governor of California, and, and you're in California right now, are you not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he he said, and I, I like to go to concerts, and I, I find something uh, very old school about live music and, and the sense of community you get at a concert, and, and he was talking specifically how there would be no live concerts until they got and I don't think I'm misquoting him to zero deaths and I I thought about the absurdity of of ever getting to a and he was talking about zero COVID deaths but um, the the implication being that we're, we're not going to allow people to gather again until it's absolutely 100% guaranteed that no one's ever going to get hurt no one's ever going to do the wrong thing no one's ever going to get sick and I thought that's just crazy yeah there seems to be no um, sort of awareness of how damaging to the social fabric this isolation is. And we're already so atomized. Um, and it's interesting, Hannah Arendt pointed to social atomization as one of the key prerequisites for totalitarianism. When people are, are isolated, um, it seems to make them more susceptible to the, a kind of social control that, yeah. um, you know, and, and clearly I think this episode of the lockdowns has whetted the appetite of our elites for social control. And you see, especially early on in the pandemic, looking to China as a kind of role model of how to handle this. There seems to be this blossoming romance between our own um, governing elites and, and China as a model. And uh, yeah, pretty disturbing. Yeah, fascinating that um, 
um, first of all, that we would take their data seriously because there's, there's no reason to believe that anything that the authoritarian Chinese government is telling us is true, but um, to sort of openly admire the, the, the same infrastructure that leads to a social credit system where the government absolutely controls your behavior. Um, are you a good citizen? Well, we'll give you access to your bank account if you're a bad citizen. And that, to me, seems fundamentally anti-individualistic, but just un-American. Like, why are we accepting that sort of infrastructure? It does seem like our institutions and the sort of progressive, you know, set that um, that runs them uh, has become quite authoritarian. And um, yeah, to to sort of to question any of this is to be pro death, right? Yeah. yeah. Not a not a good career move. Um, and I think. You know, what I call safetyism has a couple dimensions. One is just at the level of sentiment, there seems to be a feedback loop wherein the safer we become, the more intolerable any remaining risk appears. But I think that gears into this other phenomenon. It makes us more susceptible to um, sort of programs that are put in place in the name of safety. Uh, we're more kind of willing to uh, give the benefit of the doubt to that because we're so uh, afraid of everything. And often, you know, the the program that's offered on behalf of safety is really pursuing something quite different. So I talk a lot, as you know, about red light cameras in the book, uh, which turn out to be, uh, well, the, the the short version would be a scam. Um, they They often make intersections more dangerous. And what happens is when the when the cameras go up, they shorten the yellow light time, uh, which is why they get more dangerous. In addition to you know people seeing the camera and slamming on the brakes, but if you shorten the yellow light, then you get more revenue. So you know this is a way to collect rents from perfectly reasonable behavior by setting up a system that is at odds with our natural reasonableness, because in fact people don't want to crash, right? And they, yeah. and so you can rely on that to do a lot of the work for you. And so so shortening the yellow light cameras um, increases revenue, but if you lengthen the yellow light, the amber time, um, it becomes very safe. And they choose. It's very sensitive to that variable. That they yeah. Use it, right? yeah. Yeah, and you go through this, and I happen to live in the District of Columbia, and we apparently in 2016 generated 107 million dollars. Um, and if you include light, red light cameras and, and parking tickets, $193 million. Um, and so in, in one way, it's a, first of all, it's a, it's a critique of what you call the safety industrial complex. But it's also kind of a great example of, of public choice economics where the, the stated purpose of a public policy sounds like it's in the public interest but you have to sort of lift the veil and, and look at the, the interests of the, of the parties that create the policy. And in this case, they just, they just want the money. Yeah. So, right. There's nothing new or especially interesting about municipal corruption. It's, you know, it's always, especially when you look at Chicago, there's a, there's a great story in the, in the book about Chicago, where it turns out some, somebody, on the transportation manager was getting a kickback of a few thousand dollars for every camera that went up. And uh, he was probably serving as bag man for people higher up the food chain. But in any case, um, so municipal corruption, right? Bad, but not terribly novel. But where I think it does get interesting is um, when it's in the name of safety, that becomes a lever of moral intimidation to arrest criticism or even kind of, um, you know, investigation about what's going on. And it took some really dogged, determined reporting by the Tribune to kind of, and they had to bring in traffic engineers from out of state to really see what was going on in Chicago because, you know, it's the machine. You don't just, uh, you don't cross it unless you live somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, I saw you give 
a talk back when such things were legal to, to speak to other human beings in a, in a common space. And, and you showed this video, which is just fantastic. I could watch it all day of a traffic intersection in Ethiopia, I believe it was. And, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was sped up, but it, to, to someone that's watching it without knowing what to expect, you're expecting for everyone to crash and all the pedestrians to get run over because it looks like complete chaos, but the opposite happens. Somehow, without any lights, without any uh, uh, formal rules, government rules, the whole thing sort of works itself out. And I've actually been in that traffic jam in Mumbai. And there's, there's elephants and there's tuk-tuks. And, and I'm always told when I'm in Mumbai that I should never drive because I don't understand those, those tacit rules of the road. I would, I would kill myself. Um, but, but just showing that, that, that video sort of helps uh, hopefully explain what you're trying to get at with this, with this whole notion of, of, of social intelligence. Yeah, it's a, it's a picture of, it looks like chaos, but it's a kind of order. It's closer to the kind I think that emerges in organic systems, uh, rather than some kind of top down, grid of moves that are superimposed on the traffic landscape. It's interesting, there was a, um, a case in Holland, the Netherlands, of a town that was having a lot of um, pedestrians hit by cars. And they brought in some traffic engineers to try to solve that. And these traffic engineers undertook this experiment that was quite radical. What they did, instead of putting up more stop signs, more lights and all that, they removed all lights, all stop signs, not only that, but all painted lines on the street, all the curbs. So, um, and what happened is that the accident rate plummeted. So the question is why? Well, when people come into this town, all those cues that normally tell you that you're in this kind of highly administered space uh, that is doing a lot of the judgment for you are gone. And so you kind of realize it's all on you. People pay attention, they slow down. So I thought that was an interesting case of how idiot proofing, you know, usually proceeds by treating us as if we were idiots and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because we're no longer exercising our intelligence, uh, our skills erode, our capacity for attention or l inclination to pay attention erodes. So there we are. Now we're idiots. And now we have to have some benevolent entity come in and, and do everything for us, whether it's a bureaucracy or some tech. You know, this, I don't know if you'll buy this, this analogy, but I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Sweden, who has been almost universally demonized for not um, embracing this, this new social experiment that we call lockdowns. And, and my own guess is that when all is said and done that um, the numbers, you know, adjusting for variables such as age and health, that the numbers on COVID are probably gonna look quite similar across these different cultural experiments. But um, if you say, that we're going to let the governor or the president or you know the, the health advisor with the government, if that person is in charge of keeping us safe, um, maybe that, that those individual responsibilities that you take, um, maybe it's wearing a mask, maybe it's um, um, staying home if you're sick, you know, things that your mom taught you um, that, that were ways of, you know, the old way of, of preventing these things. Um, maybe you get more careless and maybe you just assume that somebody smarter than the rest of us has it all figured out. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to fall in line and not pay attention. Yeah. So there's a kind of infantilization that happens, um, which does, I mean, the, as a kind of cumulative educational project does make us more pliable to various kinds of social control. And right now, you know, a, a public health crisis is serving as a 
the kind of grand social experiment to see, well, how far can we go with this? Yeah, that sounds conspiratorial. I don't think there's, there is a conspiracy, but I think a kind of post hoc uh, eagerness to uh, to seize this moment. And then obviously at, at, at a sort of high level of governance, all this talk about the great reset, you know, the motto being don't let a crisis go to waste. Here's an opportunity yeah. to kind of re-engineer things from the top uh, because precisely because people are so afraid. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's a conspiracy so much as the natural tendency of people with power to want to collect more power. Yeah. And, and they may well be doing it thinking that it is exactly what civil society needs. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a conspiracy in the sense that they're, that they're trying to destroy society. They just think that they're smart enough to, to redesign it better. Right. So we're back to that idea of kind of a lack of epistemic modesty and yeah. scientism that, that Hayek F talks fatal about. Conceit, maybe. We quote a lot of Hayek on my show. Sorry about that. You know, you actually have a specific example of, of how dangerous the dumbing down of, of these human skills, um, some very tacit and some inarticulate when it comes to automation in, in commercial airplanes. Tell, tell that story. Well, with driverless cars, we're kind of going down a road that we actually went down decades ago with uh, uh, airplanes. So, um, so the, the contemporary cockpit is a highly automated place. And so we have a big body of literature studying uh, crashes and what went wrong. And we have, you know, all the kind of training data trying to get pilots used to using all this automation. And there are a number of things that emerge. One is that, um, you know, if you have warnings that something has gone amiss, the pilot tends to substitute listening for the warning for attending to what's actually going on. Um, there's the problem of, you know, things going perfectly 99% of the time. And so what, what then? Well, then you space out and do something else. And when things do go wrong, getting your head back in the situation and sort of grasping all the variables takes a certain amount of time. And that's called the problem of rapid onboarding. So now in the airplane, everything is happening at a much slower time scale than on a city street, say, right? You might have minutes to respond rather than fractions of a second. So all these problems and what's called the human factors research, it's sort of automation interacting with human beings have turned out to be quite significant challenges for driverless cars that were very much kind of underreported in the hype surrounding driverless cars. Um, it, and it tends to be a, if you want to go this route, it's a sort of all or nothing thing where you have to make the automation actually smarter than the humans because the human isn't going to have any clear picture of uh, the whole logic involved. So it's a, it's a kind of all colonizing um, tendency. This uh, it's a, it's a theme of uh, earlier works of yours as well, but the, the atrophying of, of skill, the, the ability to make things, the ability to drive, the, the ability to um, solve an infinitely complex problem um, instinctually at, at that moment when you need to stop at that intersection. Um, why are we losing that? It's a good question. <clears throat> maybe, maybe it takes a determination to preserve it. Um, simply because there's money to be made by taking human beings out of the picture, you know, sort of systematizing everything. There's a thinker named Ivan Illich that I quote in there who has this idea of a radical monopoly, which is not simply, you know, one firm prevailing over all the other firms, but a reordering of what's possible. And 
related to that uh, is the idea of a major tool. So, you know, instead of, so for example, we have the healthcare system as opposed to people kind of having, you know, uh, a certain amount of medical knowledge and folk medical practices helping one another uh, or schooling. Schooling becomes the preserve of the, of the schooling system. His point is that we kind of forget how to do things for ourselves and for one another because there's a major tool taking care of it all, as opposed to the kind of limited tools that are directly intelligible to the practitioner and that support what he calls conviviality, which is this the social element in um, sort of gaining competence, the apprenticeship sort of model, passing knowledge on, sharing it. I don't know how I got on that long digression. I've forgotten uh, where we started on this. Well, it was I was wondering how we how we lost that that sort of human instinct to to tinker and to learn and to to sort of you know master the automobile, right? I don't think we actually have lost that. Well, I don't know. Maybe there is a generational effect here. You, we opened with talking about um, the kids these days not wanting yeah. to drive. But I, I mean, there's clearly a huge hunger for do-it-yourself and a thriving, you know, YouTube tutorial stuff. I mean, you, anything you want to learn how to do, you can you can learn from YouTube, which is fantastic. Yeah. But but again, you all it always feels a bit oppositional. It feels like you're being a dissident, like you're beating the system because um, things are designed not to be repairable, and there's even now you know, attempts to claim intellectual property rights over, say, the diagnostic software that might be embedded in the thing. So there's all kinds of money to be made by rendering people into sort of passive and dependent consumers. Yeah. Basically, it's an accelerated obsolescence of of the thing if you can't fix it. Yeah, and, have... Go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was just going to say, the reason that whole gearhead culture appeals to me is that it cultivates this deep cognitive ownership over your car that really stands in contrast to all that. Yeah. And that's the, the part of the, and I want, I want you to talk about that because that's the, um, for it's basically the second half of the book that I haven't gotten to, but, but the, you have, um, uh, definitely the first chapter and maybe the first half of the book lays out a fairly dystopian, um, story about how big tech, um, you know, maybe in cahoots with, with government planners is, is turning our, us into this, um, dystopian world where we're all sort of mindless, passive cattle on, 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 on someone else's transportation. But the counter revolution is, is the people that are hacking those computer systems and cars and, and people that, are going back to the ancient ways where you would actually build your rebuild your own engine. Um, that to me, like I always, I always look at like the the human counter revolution when when I see a, a disturbing trend in society, and and to me the magic is there. Like I think that's that's where the future is headed. People are are actually because we are human, we're going to reject that centralization. Yeah, I have a chapter titled Folk Engineering that is about the gearhead scene and sort of people taking things in hand for themselves and, and uh, you know, making parts even is something I, I do myself. Um, and one thing that's interesting about that to me is um, when you have efforts at innovation that are widely dispersed, you know, people in their garages doing stuff, it generates incredible breakthroughs. I, I mentioned this in, earlier in our conversation about the state of the art of, of um, you know, horsepower uh, and what people are, are doing these days. And so as opposed to the idea of a centralized R&D model, whether it's the you know Soviet five-year plan or you know, Google hoovering up buying firms that pose some kind of threat and integrating them into its little Google universe 
things become very centralized. And there's a, so I think there's a, an epistemic point here to be made, which is that, you know, these widely dispersed efforts uh, really do, uh, that's where technological progress comes from. And if you look at patents over time, you know, they have just gone off a cliff. It used to be we were doing a lot of innovating and not so much anymore. And again, that, that sort of clash between so, sort of the radically individualist entrepreneur that's, that's, that's pursuing a better solution to something just because they want to do it. And, you know, there's, there's perhaps no uh, greater social goal in mind when you're doing that. It's just a problem you want to solve because it feels good to solve it. I would actually temper what you just said. You said radically individualist, and it, it and from one angle, it looks that way. But on the other hand, it's because you have these communities and these forums talking to one another, that's what pushes the state of the art forward. So it does definitely have a social element. Yeah, and that's but that's the other piece of the puzzle. And I, I think this metaphor applies to um, almost everything. You have that, that individualistic creative aspect of any innovation, but then you have that social intelligence that comes from uh, a connection with a community and, and that community has a purpose. And, and, and by the way, that, that, that community is, is probably where gearheads get a real sense of, of belonging. Like it's, it's, it's what gives their life's meaning. If I don't know if that's an exaggeration, but I, but my sense is that's probably true. Well, I think it's, um, it's a kind of aristocratic sensibility that's cultivated. And by that, I mean, you know, these are the, your peers. You know, you only care about the judgment of people who are kind of on the same level of you as. So, you know, on the forum I spend a lot of time on, there, there are a few people whose, whose judgment matters to me and, you know, kind of judging my, my build. But we could also talk about motorsport. So now not the building of a car, but um, you know, there's this whole grassroots motorsport scene in different different disciplines. And in the book, I go around to these sort of scenes and report what I see. And you know, driving is an art that can be taken to an extraordinary level of finesse that is just quite beautiful to behold. Um, in trying to understand what I saw, I was helped quite a bit by this Dutch historian, Johan Huizinga, who wrote about play uh, as the basis of civilization, actually. And for him, he's talking about um, a kind of play that's competitive, really. So he looked at archaic societies with things like ritualized combat, uh, competitive dances, uh, boasting matches, and stylized insult trading, which made me think of like the rap battles of the 90s. Uh, it's very interesting. He says, play combines the spirit of friendship and hostility, which makes total sense to me. I play like pickup hockey games where it's, you feel this camaraderie and you're, and you're trying to take each other's head off at the same time. And ultimately, play is um, in a, it re involves a, being in a state of tension where there's uncertainty and you're taking risk. So it cuts, you know, completely against the whole mentality of safetyism. Um, and it's, you know, it's where some of the most impressive human uh, qualities are are cultivated. Yeah, you uh, early on you have, and maybe it's in the, in the introduction, you have a passage about the um, thrill, and it's thrill is not a strong enough term to use, but the but the the feeling you get when you successfully do something on your bike that could have ended horribly, but it didn't. Yeah, and sometimes that's you know on a dirt bike riding through the woods that might happen at 15 miles an hour because there's roots and rocks and mud and you know steep descents and creek crossings and it takes total concentration and if i push the pace a little bit you know beyond maybe where i should and it goes well i feel enlarged i feel somehow 
existentially justified in having taken that leap of faith. Now, of course, it doesn't always go well. I've broken a lot of bones doing that. Um, so the question is, well, why would you do such a thing? And so that really was the hunch I wanted to pursue. One of them in writing this book is this hunch that risk is somehow bound up with some of the kind of more, I don't know, enlarging human possibilities. Are you, do you, I have to ask you if you've ever heard a song by a band called Rush called Red Barchetta. Do, do you know this song? I love Rush, but I, I might recognize the song, but not the title. So Red Barchetta is from Moving Pictures, and it's a, it's a futurist story about an uncle who built this illegal car and the thrill of driving it, and then the, then the man chases them down and they lose them at the last minute. I got I to gotta find this song. Yeah, you got to check it out because I was, I was very much reminded of it. And, and it, it gets to the last subject that, that I want to talk about um, because um, the consequences in that song are catastrophic. If you get busted building this car, owning this car, driving this car for reasons we don't know. Um, but, you know, the authorities, the safetyists have decided that, that individual citizens should not own cars anymore. And yet they do it because that's where they get their sense of life. That's where they get their purpose and their dignity. And there's this trend in modern politics that I was also thinking of when I was reading your book, uh, Alex, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make this political at all, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talks a lot about dignity and the lack of dignity in work and and the, the loss of, of a sense of, of purpose. And and I have this half-baked theory that perhaps one of the upsides and the downsides of, of the power of free market capitalism is that we know longer with, with, in this country at least, um, certainly there are places around the globe where starvation definitely under lockdowns is still a thing, but, but we don't spend our days anymore wondering how we're going to feed our kids. Um, we are wealthy enough as a country that, that this is something that is not the existential burden that it was before. So we're, we're trying to figure out why we live and what our, what our purpose is and, and where we get dignity um, it strikes me that that part of your project is actually trying to figure out where that that sense of life comes from, and it doesn't come in your mind from automation. I guess I would point to um, you know as a source of kind of this existential meaning or whatever we're getting at here. I would point to activities that call on our best capacities and that have room, sort of a lot of headroom for improvement so that you feel an increase in your capacity. So Nietzsche said that joy is the feeling of your powers increasing. So, you know, I opened the book talking about learning to ride a bicycle as a kid and learning to ride a skateboard. And with each of these steps in your expanding your powers of mobility by incorporating these machines with your body, they become like a, a prosthetic almost. And, you know, this is, this is, we have to bring our, our, uh, our sights way down here. We're not going to do Aristotle uh, today, but, you know, just for myself, you know, rock going at nine or 10, um, on a twisty mountain, you know, mountain road on a motorcycle. Uh, that's, you know, it sounds like something decadent, maybe that's just thrill seeking, but it's not, it's, it's not Russian roulette or it's not riding a roller coaster, this passive sort of consuming a, an, an experience. It's, um, it's the cultivation of skills where there's something very real at risk. And, that's not, uh, you know, it's not going to get you to moral virtue or something, but it is something distinctly human without which I think we become degraded. Uh, we become like Nietzsche's last man who's simply devoted to his own comfort and uh, convenience and safety. 
it's something that a little bit, um, you know, disgusting or something about that picture. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's too strong a word, but you know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's a provocative word, but I, I, I see where without purpose, you could get there. Let's, uh, let's wrap up. Why don't you tell everybody, first of all, I'm going to give everybody a reading assignment. You have to get this book and read it. And I don't know if it's, there's, there's the camera over there. Uh, why we drive towards a philosophy, of the open road, Matthew Crawford, and you have an earlier book. You have several books, but one is called Shop Class as Soulcraft. There are some similar themes in that. I read a, a short version of that. And uh, where where do we connect with you? Where do we get your stuff? I don't have. I'm not on Twitter or social media or anything. Um, I have a website, but it's it doesn't get you very far. It's MatthewBCrawford.com. So in other words, we have to go old school and read a book. Yeah, yeah. It's it's underrated. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.